Good afternoon and, uh, and welcome to today's webinar advocating for lower speeds. My name is Mark O'Connor Diaquan. I am Deputy Director at Transportation Alternatives. Um, this is the first of three webinars today, uh, the second and final day of our Vision Zero pop-up conference. Um, yesterday, we held a webinar on designing for lower speeds and today's focus for this panel is on advocacy. Um, we know that um, that you can have all the facts on your side and it still not be enough. Uh, one example in, in the world of Vision Zero and, and traffic safety, um, in Texas in 2019, the same month as Vision Zero was announced as a state policy, the state also outlawed red light cameras, essentially prohibiting localities, any city or county from operating uh, red light cameras. And in places across the US, we are seeing speed limits increase, not lowered, directly contradicting the science and, and data on what saves lives. So it's clear as most of us know that having the data on your side, having the tools available that save lives, that is only the first step. So today we are going to hear from people who have experience with those additional steps, the advocacy, the campaigning, the fighting and the agitating that it takes to break through to have uh, just and life-saving policies enacted and implemented. Today's panelists will show what it takes to break through, to reach and push those in power, the, the gatekeepers with the levers to affect change on the ground. Um, we will discuss what the role of, uh, of lawmakers are, those lawmakers who recognize what is often the insanity of the, the status quo really, and what lawmakers can do and how they can work with, with advocates. Um, so these are some of the things we'll discuss, and I am excited and honored to be joined by today's panelists, uh, who are uh, Jane Martin Laveau, who is a member of Families for Safe Streets, who fights for safe streets free from traffic violence in, in New York. We are joined by New York State Senator Brad Hoylman, who is a friend of the Safe Streets movement, Families for Safe Streets, and has successfully sponsored and pushed legislation in, in various areas. We are joined by Jemima Hartshorn, who is the founder of Mums for Lungs in London, UK, fighting for clean air. And we are joined finally by Jason Horton, who represents Vera Mobility. Vera Mobility being uh, one of the world's uh, leading and largest companies providing speed safety cameras, red light cameras, and, and other uh, traffic safety uh, devices. So with that, um, I want to welcome you all, and I want to uh, welcome Jane martin Levo and uh, turn it over to Jane as the first speaker today. Jane. Thank you so much, Marco. Um, greetings, everyone, and thank you for having me here today. My name is Jane Martin Laveau, and I am a member of Families for Safe Streets. So we'll begin with the next slide. On the morning of January 5th, I learned that my beloved Leonora had been killed in a violent car crash. Along with a friend who was driving her home, and the reckless speeding driver who caused the crash, whose three passengers were also seriously injured. Reports indicated that the drunken quartet was traveling at a rate of speed somewhere between 60 and 100 miles per hour on a New York City street. Three lives ended then and there. My life, as well as the lives of three families and sets of friends was shattered. We will never be whole again. Next. Leonora was our baby, our little girl, and a part of our family for 24 years. She was a member of her school communities and later her work communities. She had studied photography and was majoring in psychology. She had a boyfriend who had proposed to her. She was much loved. Next. 
as it so happens, my great grandfather, Herman Chalfin, was killed by a reckless driver in 1936. Uh, newspaper articles have just recently surfaced about that. And my grandfather, Benjamin Cantor, was also killed by a reckless driver when I was an infant. That's some family legacy. Next. Erwin Meyer was the conductor of the Kings County American Legion headquarters band with which I performed for many years. He too was struck by a motorist and died uh, days later from his injuries at the age of 96. I don't play music anymore. Next. Families for safe streets did not yet exist when Leonora was killed. We had no support at that time. I was grateful to happen upon its amazing founders with their strength and vision for improving street safety as they were able to channel their grief into action. We're a group that no one wants to be a part of. Every one of our members had lo loved ones stolen from them or have been seriously injured or care for someone who was. Our lives have all been changed forever. So our mission is to confront the 100 plus year epidemic of traffic violence by advocating for legislative and policy change and providing support to those personally impacted. We started with under two dozen members in 2014 and sadly now have hundreds. We work to make changes and provide support in New York City. Addressing traffic violence is a growing movement. Others have asked to replicate our efforts. So we now have 16 chapters across the country. A few others are in formation. The pandemic and everything being virtual has lent itself to more collaboration among the chapters, especially for our support community events. Today's session is about speed and that is one of our most important priorities. We have a speeding epidemic and it is killing people. And listen to these numbers. Nine out of 10 people are killed if the driver is going 40 miles per hour. At 20 miles per hour, nine out of 10 survive. Five to 10 miles per hour is the difference between life and death. At FSS's first meeting, the decision was made to fight for lowering the speed limit. Speeding was not the reason for everyone's crash, but to be focused, we chose this life-saving issue. Mayor de Blasio had run on a campaign platform to bring vision, vision Zero to New York City, but lowering the speed limit was not initially included, most likely because he didn't think it was politically possible to get permission from the New York State Legislature in Albany. FSS's initial request was to lower the speed limit to 20 miles per hour, as had been recently introduced in London. We went to Albany, our capital, many times, and we even went with the DOT commissioner and other city officials. We got a call from City Hall requesting that we back a compromise bill for 25 miles per hour. It was a hard decision, but FSS and TA agreed to proceed. Much to everyone's surprise, we were able to pass the bill in one legislative session, something that is never, that is nearly unheard of in Albany. It was a huge win. We have not yet achieved Vision Zero, but we have had many successes here in New York and know that their advocacy is making a difference. We are a people-powered movement, and I'll share how we at FSS, together with TA, advocate for lower speeds. So how do we do it? Before being personally impacted by traffic violence, the majority of us had never been advocates for safe streets. We would never have succeeded without the partnership and leadership of transportation alternatives. With 45 years of experience, TA shares with FSS their extraordinary knowledge of transportation, street safety, community organizing, and the how-to of working with legislators and community leaders both downstate and upstate. We are an integral part of the work TA does and FSS has become an integral part of TA achieving goals together that alone we could not. TA helps us present the facts 
As you can see in this graphic, legislators and others can easily see how much more effective speed safety cameras can be than police officers. We were able to use this type of information to show that our speed camera pilot program was successful and to advocate for expansion. Language is also an important part of our advocacy work. As the data shows, collisions are not just accidents, but preventable crashes. We make that clear to each and every legislator and reporter with whom we meet. As part of our partnership theme, coalition building is essential. For our speed camera campaign, which had the hashtag every school, we built a coalition of over 300 organizations, including unions, hospitals, social service organizations, and schools, the largest coalition TA had ever assembled. The power of FSS and community organizing in general is that it amplifies our individual voices and personal stories as part of a collective whole. By telling our stories, I'm always ready with my photo, we sweep aside the opposition and harness the political will of legislators previously reluctant to take a stand. We bring the moral author authority to bear. It is hard to say no to us. Our voices, coupled with strong grassroots advocacy efforts using targeted, strategic, multifaceted techniques is really what brings us success. Patience is probably important, but we don't have patience. Too many lives are at stake. So we think strategically through our goal, our obstacles, and who our targets must be using the organizing model of the Midwest Academy. As you'll see in the video that I'm about to share, persistence and creativity are critical. From meetings with legislators, to rallies at our Capitol, to me getting arrested with other FSS members, this is how we do it. sound. Is there sound? We're just working We're just on getting the sound. Ago, so. Now we're the group nobody should ever have to join. We came together, several of us met after our children and family members were killed. And then for me, it's five and a half years ago since my 12 year old son was killed. And it's um, still horrific every day. But we are trying to uh, turn pain into purpose. Myself and other people made some great you know, strides in you know making the streets safer. There was always a thought that a you know additional organization of survivors who had levels of you know, stronger organization to move different things forward. We hadn't been really as well versed in what activism might be, what forms it might take. That was a huge turning point. Um, 
once we formed ourselves as families for safe streets. It broadened the uh, appeal of transportation alternatives beyond the cycling community to pedestrians and everyone. I started my own activism. My power grew and it's like I was a tiny brook and I kept going and all the brooks joined me and I became a powerful uh, river. Today, we are announcing the creation of Families for Safe Streets. That was one of the top items in my uh, improving from my new substantial uh, brain injury. So that was part of my uh, my efforts and obviously reducing deaths and injuries in the streets of New York uh, was top of the list. Changing policy is not just about being right. It's about bringing the right people around the right table at the right time. And I'm always grateful that I had the opportunity to bring members of Families for Safe Streets around the right table at the right time. Families for Safe Streets saw a real change early on in 2014 when we changed the speed limit from 30 to 25. Within months, we had this bill passed. We thought, you know, oh, well, we can do this. You know? Yeah, right. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sergeant Guglielmo. They're obstructing vehicular traffic. I'm ordering you to leave this roadway. As the clock was ticking towards the deadline where the cameras were going to have to be turned off, and frankly, failure was looking more and more likely, we just worked harder and harder and put more pressure on our elected officials to the point where we had events for speed cameras almost every day. Do your job! Do your job! Push it, come to shove, and... I said, you know, it's time. We had four lanes of rush hour traffic, dead standstill. Police with their bullhorns telling us if we didn't go peacefully, we would be arrested. I was in the jail cell. I was in the jail cell. It was a second um, uh, civil disobedience action. in front of State Senator Marty Golden's office. He wouldn't even come in to his office because he was afraid of us. It was ridiculous. And we got arrested. And it was unbelievable that we women whose children had been killed, we were in jail. We were in Albany, and it was so disappointing to hear people to see people ignore us, run away from us, um, pretend like we weren't there, and it was painful. It was really painful. We would like to give you these. These are letters from your constituents. All support the speed cameras. My son is dead. I go visit almost every weekend of the cemetery, and I cry and I cry. And I say, Giovanni, I do whatever is necessary to save lives. And that's exactly why I'm standing here in front of you guys. I think we went to Albany 50 times. Meetings here, meetings with coalition partners, you know, really, truly pouring in our blood, sweat, and tears. And it feels great when it finally happens. This bill is now all. With a Democratic majority in the Senate, that made it possible to get a renewal of speed cameras. But without our focus on the issue, we wouldn't have gotten an expansion. We built a force that was unstoppable. <laughs> what do you think? Congratulations, the bill is signed. <laughs> I'll admit I cried <laughs> and felt so proud of this incredible group of New Yorkers that have put their pain to the side and stood close to the worst thing that ever happened to them to make sure that justice is delivered for New York City kids. Um, those types of wins, uh, there's nothing like it. It's just amazing to see that around schools, some of the most dangerous places and some of the places where children go the most, children are being protected. This is not the end, it's still the beginning. There are a lot of more things.
things that have to happen. Indeed. As you can see, we have some um, powerful activists among us. And um, for me, being a part of an organization um, with growing strength in numbers um, and such fearful leaders makes it easier for me to show up, to hold up my photos and FSS signs and speak at rallies and vigils and protests and press conferences. We do it so that others don't have to experience the devastating losses of life and limb and loved ones that we have had to bear. Next. But sometimes we need to do more. Sometimes words and pictures aren't enough. Sometimes actively participating and expressing anger, deeper messages, sorry, sorry, larger, deeper messages, such as presenting large numbers of body bags or empty shoes or tire marks on bodies and faces is more meaningful to onlookers and their representatives. Sometimes blocking streets in the name of street safety and being prepared to be arrested is called for. So when necessary, we push back because making change requires it. Uh, thank you once again for this opportunity and for joining us in the fight for, for safe streets. And here is the contact information for FSS. Thank you. Jane, thank you for, for sharing your, your memory of of Leonora with us and the, the memories of your other loved ones uh, whom we lost to, to traffic violence. Um, and thank you for your incredible strength in, in turning your grief into to life-saving uh, action. Um, and I want to welcome our next speaker, uh, New York State Senator Brad Hoylman, who some of you may have spotted in more than one of the images that uh, Jane shared. Uh, Senator? Thank you so much, Marco. Uh, such an honor to be here and um, to see those photos, to see those moving images and to see the progress that's been made. And I wanna give a special shout out to my colleague, Senator Andrew Gennardis, who was really in the crucible of this fight as he won an election based on this issue of safer streets in large part. Uh, as you saw uh, so many demonstrations uh, outside of a uh, former Senator Martin Golden's office who did not respond to this issue uh, to the community's um, uh, needs. And my colleague, Assemblywoman Deborah Glick, who fought in the trenches for so many years without a Senate partner um, and now has uh, a Democratic Senate under Andrea Stewart Cousins to partner on these um, important issues. And, and one of them uh, I wanna talk about today. Um, I also wanna thank uh, Transportation Alternatives uh, Together for Safer Roads uh, for this pop-up conference. And, and again, uh, uh, Jemima and, and especially Jane, uh, what, a, what an honor to be here today with you. And thank you as, as Amy and Mary Beth have said so, often but so effectively to turn pain into purpose has really made this uh, campaign what it is today. So thank you for, for sharing your memories of your loved ones who did not uh, die in vain. Um, I um, am gonna talk about um, today uh, about um, an important issue. Uh, to reintroduce myself, I'm State Senator Brad Hoylman. I represent um, a big part of Manhattan that includes uh, the village, uh, both East and West, Chelsea Hills Kitchen, Columbus Circle, Times Square, Upper West Side, the East Village, Midtown East, the Lower East Side, um, the Theater District, uh, all of which have had the need for variable speed limits given how congested they are. Um, last year, uh, I introduced uh, Sammy's Law, uh, at, named after Sammy uh, Cohen Eckstein, uh, a bill that would finally return autonomy to New York City to control setting its own speed limit on city streets. Uh, I'm proud um, 
the transit victories we've sponsored in the past, um, some of them non-legislative, including lowering the speed limit on the West Side Highway with the assistance of your organizations uh, by five miles per hour. Uh, you know, that Boulevard, Route 9A, a state boulevard used to be known as Death Avenue for over a hundred years until there were improvements, but tragically there have been some uh, serious deaths and injuries. I got involved in this when I saw a woman literally posting um, posters on light poles uh, along the West Side Highway that said, drive like your kid lives here. And uh, she was from Rochester and her son, Jack, who was 23 years, had moved to New York City um, and within six months was dead because he was struck by a car on the West Side Highway. Um, but we were successful in lowering that speed limit. And last year I sponsored legislation to mandate seatbelts and the back seats of taxis, limousines, and ride shares. Um, we know that uh, seatbelt saves lives and I'm proud to you know, be part of that effort here. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you uh, all about um, the importance of speed limits, the current status of New York City speed limits and how we got there. Before I begin, um, just wanna also say that uh, there were two kids and five adults taken to the hospital with injuries when multiple cars went barreling through an outdoor dining set up near 2nd Avenue and uh, East uh, 50th Street just, just this very morning. Um, the most recent uh, crashes uh, underscore the urgency with which we need to, to lower the speed limit and give New York City the power to do that. So uh, next slide, please. Um, protecting our communities is one of the core functions of government and one of our top priorities in the Senate. Uh, for too long, the car culture has framed the carnage on our streets as inevitable, uh, but that simply isn't true. Uh, no more death avenues. Uh, we can keep people safe and we will do so with the proper tools. Uh, traffic, deaths and injuries, as you know, and have just said today, are not accidents, but crashes that can and should be prevented with the proper street designs, traffic rules and enforcement. Next slide. Um, all available data tells us a consistent story, that speed kills. It's simple physics, uh, a faster vehicle is traveling, the more force it has when it strikes a pedestrian, cyclist, uh, or another driver. Speed also shrinks the available reaction time for a driver, making it much harder to avoid collisions in the first place. A 25 mile per hour impact between a motor vehicle and a pedestrian results in serious injury 30% of the time and death 12% of the time. But even small reductions in impact speed make a significant difference for pedestrians' chance of survival. Studies show that a one mile per hour decrease in speed equals a 3% decrease in the pedestrian mortality rate. Next slide, please. Here's some legislative history. In 1964, the uh, state legislature, um, in its infinite wisdom, uh, despite the concerns and complaints of the traffic commissioner at the time, raised the city-wide speed limit from 25 miles per hour to 30 miles per hour. You can guess that this was the era of Robert Moses and car culture, uh, establishing the mandatory minimum speed in state law, a mandatory minimum speed. Um, this was an incredible mistake and an inappropriate intrusion by the state against the city's ability to govern itself and protect residents. I mean, why should a legislator in Buffalo have anything to do with the speed limit in Brooklyn is beyond me. And that's a question we need to ask legislators. Um, and it's a mistake um, that's taken over a half century to try to rectify it, but we're making progress. In 2013, the state legislature granted New York City the authority to pilot an automated speed enforcement program to deter speeding in 20 school zones. Again, thanks to my colleagues, mostly in the assembly. Uh, in 2014, 50 years after the state 
first interfered with the city speed limit, the state legislature lowered the state mandated a minimum to 25 miles per hour and 15 miles per hour in school zones, thanks in no small, no small part uh, due to the advocacy of groups like Transportation Alternatives, Families for Safe Streets, and others. And most recently, our most recent victory, uh, thanks to uh, Senator Bernardis and Assemblywoman Glick, the speed camera pilot we started in 2013 was expanded significantly. Um, the program currently operates in 750 school zones with over 2,000 cameras, now running from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. on weeknights year round. And these reforms have um, allowed our city to make significant strides in safety, but there's still more work to be done. Next slide. The continuing problem, despite the progress made in reducing traffic deaths and the uh, 243 people were killed in crashes last year. 243, making 2020 the deadliest year in New York City since the introduction of Vision Zero in 2014. Um, the pandemic has most certainly played a role. Speed cameras have captured a significant rise in speeding in the city over the course of the last year. Last March, as the city went into lockdown, the automated system issued nearly twice the number of daily tickets when compared to just the month prior. Next slide. In October of last year, I introduced Sammy's Law with Assembly Member Dick Godfrey in honor of Samuel Cohen Eckstein. We all know him um, and his memory, may it be a blessing. A 12 year old who was tragically killed by a driver in 2013, just months before his bar mitzvah. Sammy's family took their grief and channeled it to make change in New York and beyond, and we are so grateful for their work. Um, they helped fam found Families for Safe Streets and uh, to advocate uh, with all of the advocates uh, on this Zoom and elsewhere for the important legislative changes uh, that we, we've mentioned so far. Um, and a special acknowledgement to my constituent, Joan Dean, Sammy's grandmother, who with the advocates on this Zoom and with the advocates who have got arrested and been part of civil disobedience and taken uh, countless, uh, uh, made countless calls and trips to Albany uh, to their tireless advocacy, Families for Safe Streets has made an enormous difference in Albany. I can tell you that my colleagues know who you are. They recognize your colors. They know your faces. Um, you're one of the most effective lobbying organizations in the Capitol. And so I'm very grateful for that. Sammy's law would repeal the state speed limit mandate for New York City and control over adjusting speed limits with shift back to New York City uh, which would now have the power to set speed limits as low as they determine necessary. Next slide. Sammy's law would give New York City the flexibility it needs to tailor speed limits to the unique needs of our city's diverse neighborhood. Uh, lower speed limits are a crucial element of creating open streets and generally a more welcoming street space for outdoor dining, which is skyrocketed, shopping, community use. Uh, the latest report from Transalt calls for returning 25% of street space from drivers back to the community by 2025. I strongly support that. It's an exciting and ambitious proposal and lower speed limits are going to play an important role in this plan. And most importantly, lower speed limits are going to save lives. Next slide. Unfortunately, and before we can make Sammy's Law a reality, we have several hoops to jump through. Um, even though Albany has exerted control over the city's speed limits, the law requires the city council to pass a home rule request before the state legislature can even vote on this bill. In Albany, um, we still have to overcome an institutional mindset that the state should have control over decisions uh, as fundamentally um, municipal as setting speed limits. Uh, but now that both houses of the legislature are controlled by democratic 
majorities, Democratic super majorities, uh, with strong representation from the city, uh, I think the time is right for change. And I'm going to be fighting to make that change this year. It's one of my top legislative priorities for 2021. Next slide. Of course, it's one thing to have a law in the books, uh, but we also have to ensure compliance. The speed camera enforcement program has been a proven success. Speeding is down by more than 70% on average at locations where speed cameras have been installed and injuries are down 17% at those same locations. Importantly, we're also seeking a lasting uh, and, and seeing a lasting impact. Two thirds of drivers who were ticketed in 2019 did not receive a second ticket the same year. Next slide. Again, speed cameras have been extremely successful at changing behavior when and where they've been allowed to operate. But right now there's also a major blind spot. State law doesn't allow the speed cameras to operate on nights and weekends. And 36% of all the 2020 traffic deaths occurred within range of a speed camera, but during hours when the cameras were turned off. Next slide. To address the issue, I've introduced two bills to expand the speed camera enforcement program, one with Senator Robert Jackson, which we call Fighting Underground Racing in Our Streets or Furious Act, named after that classic film, The Fast and the Furious. Uh, this bill would allow local community boards to identify neighborhood hotspots for illegal street racing, street racing where um, 24 seven use of speed cameras would be allowed. During the pandemic, we've unfortunately seen, again, a spike in illegal racing. A total of 1,057 complaints have been made uh, between March and September of 2020, nearly five times uh, the same period in 2019. And racing is not only dangerous, but it's obviously uh, incredibly obnoxious. Uh, I also carry a 24 seven speed camera authorization bill um, that would allow all speed cameras citywide to operate nights and weekends by repealing time limitations in state law. Um, both of these approaches would address the need for expanded hours of operations. And like Sammy's law, both would require a home rule message from the city council before we could pass them uh, in Albany. And both, I would add, uh, are an important step forward uh, in our at efforts at criminal justice reform. Let's remove NYPD out of ticketing and let the technology do the work on behalf of the people. Um, finally, I'm the co-prime sponsor uh, with State Senator Tim Kennedy, the chair of our transportation committee up in Albany of the Vehicular Violence Accountability Act to crack down on dangerous and reckless drivers. That's a bill we worked on with District Attorney Cy Vance on. And it would address deficiencies in our traffic law so that drivers who injure or kill are held accountable. I think these bills uh, will help us ensure that our speed limits uh, and rules of the road aren't just on the books, uh, but are enforced to keep our streets safe. Next slide. So what can you do? <clears throat> to make Sammy's Law a reality, we're gonna have to work <clears throat> on parallel tracks to build support in both the city council and in Albany. It's one thing for my colleagues to hear from me, the sponsor of the bill, and boy, they hear from me a lot uh, on a lot of bills, but the impact is gonna be greater when a coalition of community members like you make your voices heard. You've got a lot of experience in that regard. So please reach out to your city council members and ask them to support a home rule message for Sammy's Law and reach out to your state senator or assembly member and ask them to co-sponsor Sammy's Law and reach out to your local community board to ask them to formally support Sammy's Law by passing a resolution in favor. Those community board resolutions really stack up and make a difference. If we all work together, we're gonna to enact the reforms we need to keep our streets safe. Thank you so much and thanks for your advocacy. Thank you very much, Senator Holman.
Uh, next, we are going to hear from an advocate or as advocates are known in the UK, a campaigner. I want to introduce Jemima Hartshorn, who is the founder of Moms for Lungs in London, UK. Um, hello, thank you for having me. Um, so thank you so much for the other speakers. I mean, it's been really inspiring and I've been, you know, really feeling very much that I'm coming from a very different angle and I'm coming much more from the air pollution angle, which I'm going to be speaking about in a sec. And to an extent, it doesn't feel quite appropriate after hearing these very strong and emotional and powerful and very sad stories. But air pollution is also a big issue, at least in some places. And it is a big issue in London where I live. And the other thing is that basically in London, Air pollution is the, one of the major sources of air of sorry traffic is one of the major sources of air pollution, and um, thereby, if you address traffic as a whole, um, obviously by just reducing it, you do increase uh, road safety so much as well. So there is a link, although I do feel a bit, um, you know, a bit, bit, bit sad to be speaking in this context. So. Um, in 2017, I was on parental leave for the first time in London, and I was walking in the streets of London with a small precious baby in my pram, and just started thinking and reading about cars, pollution, and this, this you know, baby being. And I thought, this can't be right. This can't be good. I got to the stage where I uh, started talking about it um, you know, after you stop talking about nappies all the time. And it turned out that very many other parents like me were concerned about it. And the thing is an air pollution in London, in the UK is just very high. Um, it has very many health impacts. It's linked to respiratory illnesses, wheeziness, asthma very strongly, um, stunted lung growth at the level of air pollution that we have in London. And air pollution, so tiny particulates in air pollution can enter the body through the lungs and penetrate any organ. There's been particulate matter has been found um, from diesel cars and wood burning and transport in placentas and brains and so on. So we wanted to do something about it, turn our anger into action. And we started a group called Mums for Lungs almost four years ago. And we sort of started with um, standard campaigning stuff, you know, petitions, trying to raise awareness, responding to public consultation in the UK. Many things are publicly consulted on and, you know, we submitted responses and that kind of stuff. And then after a while, we got onto school streets in 2018. And um, that felt like something that we wanted to do on top, which was, you know, is in a way more of a project and something more tangible where we basically work a lot with parents and get them excited about school streets. So I think school streets is a very UK based um, system, but I do think it is really um, amazing. So I'd like to tell you all about it. So basically a school street is when a road is closed by a school at drop off and pick up times for perhaps an hour, one and a half hours. So there are signs put up to inform drivers of the road closure they are enforced by cameras or by actually in some, in some cases even with barriers. And um, you can have exemptions. So you can have residents still driving in blue badge holders, that kind of stuff. But they are really amazing because especially once you have like a retractable bollard going in and out, you provide real safety from cars and you provide social distancing and play space, which has been crucial in COVID times. So in London, in COVID times, a year ago, there was 80 school streets across the whole city, and now there's over 300. It has basically ballooned, and we're super excited about it. So the good things about school streets are that they reduce traffic and thereby pollution, and that is the main angle why we got involved in it as an air pollution campaigning group. But then, you know, looking into it, we immediately realized what the other amazing advantages are. Road safety. I'm, I don't know of the makeup of the audience, but if you are parents, you probably all know how it is standing at a school gate, holding one kid, there is a scooter, there is a pram, and it's not safe, and it's worrying, and it's scary, and parents are losing 
their minds just start standing in the queues waiting um, to pick up kids, to drop off kids. And it's just, you know, a really terrifying atmosphere. Um, they also really enable active travel. So data has shown really strongly that even if parents used to drive to school, um, they will often reconsider it if there is a school street. So if you can't drive right to the school gate anymore anyway, but would have to leave your car further out and then walk the last bit, you are much more inclined to reconsider the whole route. So if you don't drive anymore, obviously less air pollution and the kids get a better start to the day. In London, 25% of rush hour traffic is due to the school run. Um, school streets raise awareness of the issue. So with a small, small street, you sort of raise awareness in the school communities, neighbours, people driving past of air pollution. As I said, the play space and the community, you can see it here in the picture, which is a school just around the corner from me. Um, yeah, and in COVID times, it enables social distancing for parents waiting um, for drop off and pick up. So the big basics that you need for a school street in a way is firstly the legislation. In London, the legislation existed. But what we have been doing as Mums for Lungs is we've been really reaching out to parents and providing parents with all the tools and the know-how and the resources from a you know film that can be shared on WhatsApp to a Facebook page, a Facebook group with 1,100 parents um, in it who can all exchange experiences of school streets, to the draft letter to the head teacher, and this kind of stuff. The first talking points, the you know the full the full shebang, um, we've provided. But generally, what you need to do or need to have in place for a school street campaign to be most likely to be successful is obviously the legislation. Um, then parent support. So a few parents need to be supportive of it. But also sometimes people get worried and say, well, I know some parents are against it. You know, you don't actually have to convince everyone. This is a democracy. No one has to, not everyone has to be supportive of something this um, amazing. Usually people come around once the school street has been implemented. You need to have some support from teachers. It's not going to work if the head teacher is against it. Um, other things to consider is residents. So there's an interesting uh, irony that often if the, the school has a lot of parents driving to the school, the residents are usually in favour of the school street because they just want the traffic to calm down. Whereas um, if it is a school where not many parents drive to, the residents are less likely to be supportive, but the parents are very supportive. So it's an interesting interplay, but, you know, it's all manageable. And you need some kind of, you know, local authority, whatever that is, um, to enable and fund it. So we've been working with all these levels. We, you know, initially reached out to 200 schools that we had identified could have school streets in London and didn't get much feedback, to be honest. And then we realised that teach head teachers get a million emails and a group of parents they don't know an organization reaching out is not going to be as impactful as us coming through the parents so we've you know got this wide network of parents um who sort of campaign for their school street with our support and with our resources and we have done lots of webinars with you know local authorities oh god i see a typo in there and things like that and we are in touch with schools now as well and we're currently fighting for legislation. So AMPR cameras can be installed outside of London as well to enforce school streets. Although for me personally, because of the road safety aspect, that is not the preferred option. I really like a bollard up there. So I hope that was an um, interesting overview of school streets. And if you wanna know more, if you wanna get any kind of support, help, help or resources, please get in touch. That's our uh, email, it comes to me. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook. Uh, we have a website, mumsforlungs.org or something. Thank you very much. How do I stop sharing? Sorry. Thank you so much, Jemima. Really appreciate uh, you sharing your experiences uh, from, from, from London. Next up, I want to uh, uh, welcome Jason Norton of Vera Mobility. Jason? Thank you, thank you. Um, 
Uh, I appreciate uh, being part of this. It's an honor. Um, Jane, powerful testimony. It's incredible. Um, uh, unfortunately, as Jane has uh, noticed or you know referenced in her presentation, there are other Janes in New York, and you know I've worked across the country. There are other Janes throughout the United States, and uh, it, it, the stories are just incredible. My wife and I were six weeks into a 16-year-old, and uh, now she's out there. And uh, so it just changes your perspective and your thought process. So, uh, Jane, thank you for uh, everything you've done, and thank you for sharing. Uh, it's an incredibly unselfish act on your behalf, so thank you. Uh, so we'll get into this. Uh, I'll be quick so we can get into uh, Q&As. Uh, just a little bit who we are, uh, Vera Mobility. We're the nation's largest photo enforcement provider. We do speed cameras, red light cameras, um, cameras on the side of buses, uh, which I thought years ago when we started was uh, one of the dumbest ideas I've ever seen because I didn't think anybody would pass a bus. Uh, little did I know it happens so many times during the day. We actually have videos of people passing on the right side of a bus, if you can believe that, that the impatience of a driver would trump going around a bus on the right side. It's incredible. Um, this was not an eye chart test with all the cities on there, but just kind of give you a glimpse of what's going on around the country. Uh, we do have the New York program as well. It's been referenced a few times. Uh, we know these stats and we can share them and I'll skip through them, uh, but there's 9,500 people in 2019. Uh, 2020 numbers are are not out yet, but uh, I would guess based on what we're seeing that uh, those fatalities could be even higher in 2020. Um, as we've talked about today, you think about your own experience with COVID and what has happened. So in our own neighborhood, you know, we walk the dog, we walk the dogs early in the morning and the evening. And, you know, in COVID people were walking that I had never seen before. I didn't even know they lived in the neighborhood. I've met dogs that, you know, I didn't know were in the neighborhood. You couldn't find a bike uh, to buy because uh, kids were biking like they've never done before. So you had a lot more pedestrians and cyclists out and the speeds has have just gone through the roof. Um, you know, less congestion, uh, speed, speeding is up. We thought it would be proportional. So when there were lockdowns and less traffic, we figured that we would see that same uh, line, but it was just the opposite. So it's been pretty incredible. Um, Jane, I had this exact slide on my presentation. I, when you shared it, I took it off, but then I thought I'm gonna leave it on because it's so incredibly important. Um, the difference between 20 miles per hour and 40 miles per hour in a school zone you have kids that are have not reached the level of um, decision making, right? Proper decision making on on estimating how fast that car is going. Can I go out there? Or am I thinking about something else? If I, you know, do I see a kid on the other side of the street that I'm trying to get to? It's incredibly important. So I put it back in, Jane. I left it in. Um, so for our solution, what we bring to the table, uh, speed safety cameras, um, there's about 150 communities, 17 states, and, and we also have the Washington DC uh, program. But this is, this is the only places where speed cameras are actually allowed, uh, with Georgia and Virginia being the last two states that have come aboard. Uh, Virginia has yet to launch a program. They just passed the law last year. Uh, COVID hit, everything was obviously crazy. It's starting to ramp up now. Uh, but those are the only states, ironically. Um, one of the things we do, we try to work with and support uh, different advocates. And uh, as we talked about, uh, like a Melissa Wandahl in Florida, which I'm sure Jane knows and has, has spoken to, and Melissa's probably listening in right now. Uh, has a you know a familiar horrible story personal story but has used that uh, to help others and uh, insurance institute for highway safety that uh, I'm sure everyone is familiar with when you talk when you start looking at commercial car commercials and they talk about safety they always reference IIHS and their testing Governor's Highway Safety Association obviously uh, families for safe roads and others so there are programs out there who have uh, out of the field for you and that you can jump on, learn what they've done and, and use that. Um, 
So I thought I'd go through some of these uh, myths versus the real story and, and some of the things that you hear and, and what's the real story. So higher speeds are safer for traffic. I think Marco, you mentioned this uh, in your opening that some people believe that a higher speed is actually safer. I don't think any of us believe that. Um, but you know, based on the 20, 30, 40 mile an hour uh, speeds, we know that that's not uh, appropriate. And you know, some states uh, have a maximum speed of 80 miles an hour, believe it or not. So the reaction time is uh, hard, to, hard to believe on that one. Um, I've heard this a lot and, and I've been doing this for, for you know, almost uh, probably 16 years. So I've heard a lot of these uh, programs that this is a gotcha program. And that's not, that's not at all true. And it's not the purpose of the program. Um, you know, we have a 30 day warning period that begins every program. We have warning signs at every site, much more visibility than you would any other speed enforcement possibility. The, the goal is to reduce the speed. If we don't reduce the speed, we don't sell the next program. So our goal is to reduce this speed. And these are just a couple of the ways that, that you do that. Um, the police department solves other crimes when they pull people over. So um, it, there's you know, a theory there on the police department pulling people over, solving other crimes, uh, which is fine. But this does not, they can still do that, right? Speed cameras don't stop that. This is a first multiplier for police. They can still go to other locations to so slow speed. They can still enforce at camera locations or they can issue uh, or, or go on to other things. So uh, they can still do everything that they do now. Um, you can't face your accuser. Um, so a photo enforcement program actually gives the violator uh, more evidence than ever. They can go to court, they'll have a video of their violation, they'll have pictures of their violation. They have the same amount of evidence that the prosecutor, the police, and the judge will see. And that's unprecedented. If you get pulled over by a police officer today speeding, hey, I caught you speeding, and that's, that's the end of it. Photo enforcement, you have a video of your violation. If you wanna go try to argue that, um, you know, good luck, but the evidence is overwhelming. Our city, county can't afford it. Uh, most, most programs uh, that we de design, at least, are violator funded and not taxpayer funded. So I'm sure like the senator can uh, attest that he has to make decisions every day in an appropriations. You know, what do you spend your money on? What do you spend your resources towards? But this one, you don't have to make that decision from a taxpayer standpoint. It's violator funded. So the violator pays for the program. I don't want a machine just sending out tickets. This one. Um, but the technology only captures the event. The local entity makes the final review and only they approve the citation, uh, not the machine and certainly not us. Uh, we don't have a speeding problem. That's great. Uh, but a vendor can test a location for you and usually it's for free. So you can determine, do you have a speeding program? What does it look like? What, and you know, do, you, do you really have a problem and how bad is it? So no, really we don't have a speeding program. Um, so just yesterday, some of those uh, advocates that I talked about earlier, the Governor's Highway Soci uh, Safety Association, IIHS, and the National Road for Safety Foundation actually just joined together to launch uh, initiatives in Virginia and Maryland, slow drivers down, and that included grants uh, for the program to uh, try to calm speeds, because I think everybody has experienced uh, this COVID uh, speed increase that's been unprecedented. And we haven't seen this in, in well over a decade. So I tried to breeze through that, Marco, as about as fast as I could so we could get to Q&A. Uh, I know there's questions coming in and you probably have some as well. So uh, uh, my email is there and I know uh, Marco will probably be sending out if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to share data, uh, result, results from anything uh, needed. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Yes, I want to go go straight to to Q and A. Uh, please feel free to post uh, questions in the chat. I also just heard from our uh, technical officers that we can go uh, five minutes over. Uh, so just for anyone who wants to plan for that, um, I want to ask a quick question of, of Senator um, Holman. Senator, um, can you talk about your your power as a senator on 
I think on the one hand, you are not the executive branch, you are not the mayor or the governor um, with, uh, with policy implementation powers. On the other hand, you yourself are a, a legislator in one of the biggest states in the country and you're the chair of the Senate Judicial Committee. So like, what is your um, power as a senator and how do you work with, with advocates? How do advocates work with you? Yeah, that's a great question, Marco. Um, It really is, I think, at the end of the day about coalition building and working with advocates who are successful in kind of penetrating um, the dense um, kind of fog that sometimes seems to uh, be pervasive around the state capitol. Um, You know, some people see it as a real um, kind of science, but I think it's, it's more of an art in terms of how you run a campaign, to use that word, uh, and um, how you reach uh, legislators on a personal level. Uh, and even though I'm one state senator, um, when you carry a bill that has the support of you know, hundreds or thousands of your constituents and you see them in the halls of Albany and they get legislative memos and there's science and data behind them and you have spokespeople who are well known um, or even, you know, famous, um, you can really kind of create almost an inevitability that your legislation has a hearing uh, in the conference of either the assembly uh, or the Senate. Uh, We can, as a single legislator, uh, push that uh, to ensure that my colleagues get a chance to discuss it. And from that standpoint, uh, you can then press further to hope for a floor vote um, and then you know, you have to be working simultaneously with the other house, um, in my case, the assembly, uh, because sometimes, you know, we pass a bill in the Senate and the assembly doesn't act, or we pass two bills that are different and we have to get some sort of reconciliation. So um, I would say though, um, compared to where we were three years ago under Republican majority, you know, the sky's the limit. Marco, we can, you know, I think we've got real uh, momentum behind a lot of these bills, in part because of the statistics being as bad as they are, but also because there's a new awareness around traffic safety and the nomenclature, and most importantly, the personal uh, stories and the uh, one-on-one advocacy that you and your your allies have demonstrated over the last few years. It's also finally, I would say, it's an election issue. (laughs) And we now have Senator Andrew Gennardis in no small part uh, because his predecessor refused to budge on speed counts. I think in in several of your presentations, speed cameras were featured heavily in automated enforcement. And Jason, you highlighted, uh, you know, some of the um, the concerns that people often have and the misconceptions. Um, and this is kind of a question for, for anyone who wants to, to chime in of our, of our panelists. Um, one of the things, uh, Jason, that I don't think you addressed specifically is something that, um, that a number of questions have been asked about in the, in the chat. And that is um, the, the idea that automated enforcement can have a, a disproportionate impact on low income drivers. There are uh, some uh, places where there's a belief that cameras have been placed disproportionately in majority black communities. You know, that uh, as, as we talk about the sky being the, 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 the limit, um, you know, there's still some, some hurdles that come along, along the way. And you know, I shared in the chat a report that Transportation Alternatives did last year that, that highlights how 
uh, particularly in, in New York City, uh, some of those concerns really have not borne out uh, that the cameras have been placed um, in uh, based on where crashes occur, where injuries occur. The fines are a flat $50. Um, and, and kind of other considerations. But I want to uh, open it up for anyone to chime in on that. Right. Um, I'll, I'll go first. Um, you know, there's a couple of different things. One, you mentioned, Marco, the, the fine in New York is $50. It's the, you know, it's the, probably the lowest in the country. Um, sometimes you can get into situations where they're very high. There are hundreds of dollars uh, for a ticket because of all the, the local add-ons fees. The fine itself is low but the fees are high, so that gets very expensive. Um, but the key is uh, somebody who gets and pays a ticket, has, they get mad, right? I mean, nobody likes to get one uh, a ticket, but they do remember it and it does change the behavior, which is the underlying purpose of the speed cameras. Uh, we've usually see around uh, you know, a 90% uh, you get to pay a ticket and you don't get another one. And these are for programs that have been a decade old. Right, so you're changing that behavior. We are very purposeful when we lay out a city, um, certainly size of New York or uh, uh, Philadelphia or Baltimore, or Atlanta, whomever, um, that you really look at a map too, right? And you do put those around. You don't need them every block, right? You wanna be equitable in the city where you put them. Um, but at the end of the day, we are taking pictures of the back of a car. Right. It doesn't matter who's driving that car. Um, some would even argue that it's the other way, that they're not pulling over somebody, you know, based on anything other than speed. And so the, uh, uh, the speed camera sees nothing but a speeding car and it takes the picture of a plate. And that's where it, that's, that's where it ends. Uh, even the police officers or whomever reviews it doesn't see the driver. They see the back of a car. They see a video of a car speeding uh, where they shouldn't be, and and that's that's where it is. So I think, and I think there's some studies that were in there too that that show it's probably and it's centered. I think you referenced it in your comments. It's probably the most equitable distribution of enforcement that's there because it doesn't see yeah. anything except a speeding car. I can see uh, Marco and Jason that you know s s there might be some. Um, inclination to put speed cameras in neighborhoods where there are crashes that may correlate with lower income neighborhoods or neighborhoods or communities of color. My response to that would be, let's put speed cameras everywhere. Um, you know, I believe in universal speed cameras. So, uh, um, you know, uh, but uh, that is something we need to consider. And I definitely want to look at, you know, further analysis on the placement of speed cameras and how that might have an impact on disproportionately affecting communities of color. I'll take you on the road with me, Brad, so you can advocate speed cameras. Everybody. Great, love that. Um, but I'd you like know, to chime in. yeah, go, Jay. Yeah, no, I'd like to chime in if I may. Um, um, Senator Whalen, thank you so much for mentioning also, not, not just that they should be everywhere, but that they should be 24 seven. And so that's something that we need to work toward. Um, one of the things that is totally equitable is those statistics about the rate of speed and the effect it has um, upon impact upon, upon an individual, whether a pedestrian, a cyclist, a motorist, um, they, they, a speeding car kills people. And so it's a very, very simple call for people who don't want to receive a ticket, follow the speed limit. It's that simple. And and, That's and, the point. and absolutely, Jane. And let's like let, as we talk about disproportionate impacts on you know drivers who might be ticketed, let's talk about the disproportionate impact of people who might be victims. And, you know, it, 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 Marco goes the other way, too. I, I've, you know, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time in, in cities, big and small. Um, but once you put this in and you get someone who's excited, I mean, you saw Jane's pictures, right? There was a lot of advocates cheering on the speed cameras. You get to a point where they're like, hey, I need more in my neighborhood, right? It almost it almost turns that around that people want the speed cameras in their neighborhoods because their kids are the ones walking to school or they're walking the dog or, or riding their bikes to school. 
they want cameras in their neighborhoods. So it, it works both ways on that. I want to ask uh, Jemima and uh, Jane specifically, um, and there's kind of two questions. But feel free to to answer one or, or both of them, um, Jemima and, and Jane. One, what what keeps you going, um, Jane? You are essentially in kind of an involuntary volunteer. Uh, you didn't ask to to be doing this this work. Um, and I've I've been in meetings with you with uh, with um, with uh, coalition partners with elected officials. Um, uh, so that's one. What keeps you going? And and two, uh, Jemima, you mentioned that you're advocating for cleaner uh, air and that it's different from traffic violence. But you also know that the commonalities, obviously, cars are both the leading cause of air pollution and asthma, and uh, the sole cause, essentially, of, of traffic fatalities. Um, and so, um, you know, with that, there's, there's commonalities, right? And then uh, there's significant, uh, uh, there's intersection between in various areas, which plays into building coalitions uh, for this work. Um, and so I would love to, to kind of hear about your uh, considerations, your work. You mentioned getting some of the different stakeholders, uh, for teachers, uh, parents around school streets. Um, and interestingly enough, um, schools played a central role in the fight for speed safety cameras here in, in New York City as, as well. Um, so for, for Jemima and Jane here as we, we close, I would love to hear about what keeps you going and some of those commonalities and coalition building experiences that you've had. Okay, is it okay if I go ahead, Jane? Okay, so um, what keeps me going is just thinking of the health impacts. I have young children. My daughter is turning two next week. My son is four. And I don't want them to grow up with stunted lungs for life because they're living in London. So that and everyone else's kids in London keep me going. We've had a case here recently where it was proven that that it, that it says on the death certificate, certificate of a girl that um, traffic and traffic pollution uh, strongly contributed to her deathly asthma so that you know it's it's the kids basically that keep me going and on the coalitions I mean we, we are um, working in coalitions with active travel groups and groups like a you know local ac local action vision zero group so that because I think the there is a really clear um, commonality between the issues and especially on the sources, the source of the issue. But um, the other thing is that I was, you know, I'm a very pragmatic campaigner, frankly. So what I always say to parents who want to campaign for School Street, I'm like, look, these are this is a host of arguments, air pollution, road safety, social distancing, distancing, play space, community use whatever works best for your school or for the people you have to convince. Like, you know, because it doesn't matter if a school streets comes in because of air pollution or because people are most concerned about road safety, it will address both of those issues. So go with whatever flies best. So what keeps me going, number one is I have another daughter and um, I want her to be safe. Um, I'm also a retired teacher, so just involved with children and communities, and um, traffic has an impact on everyone in the community. It's, it's children, it's parents, it's the elderly, it's um, those with uh, all sorts of challenges. Um, it, it affects every, every one of us, and so every time I go out, every time I go for a walk, every time I drive, and yes, I do drive, um, I, you know, the things that I see left and right all day, every day, um, are so disturbing that, um, you know, that I know that further action is needed. And so with the, with the cameras, uh, with speed cameras, red light cameras, all of the street design that will be talked about, um, you know, that, that just to slow people down everybody needs to slow down and um, it's it's that simple and yet it's so challenging and um, 
um, back to the the speed cameras twenty four seven and everywhere. It's just something you know. I have to I have to harp on because my deceased daughter was in fact killed on a Friday night at two, about two o'clock in the morning, and so which is very very common actually those nights of weekends when people are out partying. Um, people think they own the roads. That's one of the things that also happened during the pandemic with you, with less people around. The streets are empty. People think they can just go as fast as they want and it's actually terrifying terrorizing and um, we need to do everything that we can to stop it thank you jane and thank you jemima thank you jason and senator holman uh, with that uh, we are concluding our panel today i want to thank each of our our panelists for, for sharing your time with us, your experiences and insight. Um, and I encourage anyone who uh, is watching to tune in at 1.45 p.m. for our Advocating for Increased Accessibility and at 3.30 p.m. for Advocating for Quick Builds and then at 5 p.m. Closing Remarks by uh, TA's Executive Director, uh, Danny Harris. Um, I also want to uh, thank our sponsors for this conference, the Vision Zero Cities Pop-Up Conference, Together for Safer Roads, DoorDash, and Rebel Scooters. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you for all of you for tuning in, and I wish you the best. Thank you.